Hello, Belinda Weaver, and thanks for accepting uh, my invitation for this chat. So let's start with uh, your introduction. Okay, so I work at Griffith University, which is uh, a university located in Brisbane, Australia. I'm based in the library where I lead a team called Academic Engagement Services. So my team, I've got around 40 people, are here to support learning and teaching, but we also um, support researchers. So before I came to Griffith, I'd worked as a community lead for the Carpentries, um, which is about teaching researchers how to work com computationally on research. And before that, I was rolling out uh, research cloud services to researchers. So when I came to Griffith, I had a really clear vision about the kinds of support that I thought researchers needed, given that most researchers now are having to work with data, whether that data is large or small, and given that many have never had any kind of training at all in how to source or create or even combine, clean up, analyze, visualize, or even manage data, I felt there was a really clear need to support them on how to work with data efficiently. Sounds a very interesting job and very uh, important role for all the yep. academic research. Uh, how yep. do you define reproducible research and why do you think it's an important thing today? Reproducible research for me is research that anyone who's got the right level of skill and knowledge could replicate. Obviously, I couldn't go into a lab and start working with specimens, but someone else who'd been trained in that discipline could do that. But it means providing enough information about the research so someone else could follow similar steps and come to the same conclusion. It's a little bit like the steps people have in journalism, answering the who, what, where, when, why, and how. So if you're thinking about research, what are you setting out to do? What is the problem you're trying to address? So anyone trying to replicate your research needs to understand that. Why are you doing it? What is the desired outcome? What is your result you're aiming for? Who are the people doing it? Um, where is it being conducted? When is it being conducted? Is there a distinct time scale? Is it, you know, between you looking at how something happened between these five years or over 20 years or whatever? And the how should really provide enough information about the methods and the tools and the data that's being used in the project so that someone can see how those um, results were achieved. Now, in some cases, I think steps are missing or they're not obvious. and. So an Excel spreadsheet is a good example of that. It's a bit of a black box. So the data and the calculations are all mixed up in there together. And it can be really hard for someone else to spot an error because there's no clarity about how the formulas that trigger the output were created. Or it's really hard to even see what the method was all about. So a transcription error in an Excel spreadsheet, even something as minor as a decimal point in the wrong place, can mean the conclusions just have to be thrown away. So for me, the use of proprietary software cannot really be reproducible in the same way research conducted in open source software is, because to be truly reproducible, every single step has to be clearly documented. If you're doing the same Excel process in something like R and you're annotating your code as you go, it'll list the actual steps, the actual calculations, the assumptions, the decisions you take so that the results can be checked and replicated. So reproducible research does mean sharing a lot. It's not just about putting a data set out there and, and letting people figure it out for themselves. It's giving them enough background so people can contextualize the work, providing information on what methods you were using in the research, providing information about the tools and the software and everything relevant that would make the work reproducible by another researcher. And what I got is that it's important because it impacts lots of lives, right? On decision-making process. Yeah, exactly. You're able to follow, you know, I was trying to do this. This is what I tried. I made this decision about how I'll proceed. I had to go back and change this because it wasn't giving me the answers I thought I was getting, but every you're sort of walking in lockstep with the researcher and seeing how they got to where they wanted to go. Very cool. Uh, and how popular and common practice is reproducible research in Australia? It's not all that common, um, but there is movement. So just like in other countries abroad, um, the people who fund research in Australia, the Australian Research Council and the National Health and Medical Research Council and now the Medical Research Future Fund are starting to expect researchers to be more open and to provide more information about their projects once they're finished. So what those funders generally say is if we give you a grant, at the end of the project, you have to deposit at least the metadata about the research 
in an open repository, if not the data itself, if you can do that as well, that would be good. But you've at least got to give people enough information about the project so they know what the research was, who did it, what the outcomes were, so that the work isn't done again. And so people are aware that this work, um, work has been done if they want to make contact or they want to cite it themselves. So compliance isn't 100%. Lots of people are not necessarily aware that they have to do it or they don't do it in time, but you know it, it is improving. Um, we still see a lot of the same arguments. We talk to a lot of researchers here, so we still get the same arguments about working in that way. People say, oh, if I put my findings out there, someone will scoop me and I won't be the first to publish or, or my data is really messy. It's too much hard work to make it reproducible or another one we get all the time is someone saying, um, oh, no one would be interested in my research. I'm, I'm the only person who'd be interested in that. So there's all these arguments why people can't do it. But I think people are also worried about the scrutiny of it. Um, a lot of researchers are quite worried that people will mock how they've written their code, like say their code yeah. is bad, or they're worried their findings might be debunked and that's gonna be reputationally damaging for them. But at this university, Griffith University, we've adopted an open research statement explicitly. So um, this was something I lobbied hard for when I came here and we're the first Australian uni to have adopted that statement. So we're trying to build a culture of open research here to support open research. And we build a network of open research champions across the university to try to help other researchers get on board. We have a workshop that um, we developed called Nine Reproducible Things to help people get started. So that means someone who'd like to work reproducibly, but they don't really know how they might do that, can follow these small steps and, you know, they take the steps all the time to get there. Um, so that's something we put up on GitHub as an open lesson and people can do that in their own time. And we have a checklist of simple steps people can take. And even small things like implementing a proper file naming convention can make a big difference as to how reproducible your work can be at the end. So we've definitely built a bit of an ecosystem around trying to give people the right advice to get them started and to say it's not as hard as you might think. And what I'm getting is uh, lots of people are aware of, for example, the Griffin University has the open science uh, statement but there's still a cause of change to, yep. to be done. Uh, yeah. Okay. Certainly what we say to people, uh, like we provide a lot of information through our website about all of the means by which they might be able to do this. We explain repositories they can use, systems they can use. We'll sit down and have a consultation with someone. Um, we'll teach workshops about this stuff. We put the lessons up on GitHub so people can follow on. So we've tried to make it as accessible as possible. But the idea of having these champions who are actually researchers themselves mean that out in the research institute, someone's, someone's got a local person who's who's championing that as well because that's often more meaningful to them than talking to a librarian yeah they can relate it more with a uh, champion yep. to be inspired uh you yep. mentioned a lot of training and other activities that your team is providing how do you see the role of librarians in squatting reproducible research um, I think they can play a really important role. And that was something I was very keen to um, push when I started here at Griffith. Um, back in the olden days, when, before I came here and before I went and worked in cloud and things like that, a lot of the way that the librarians used to support researchers was helping them find information. So helping them find journal articles and books and conference papers to help them sort of understand the background to their research. But these days, a lot of researchers feel they can do that themselves. There's Google Scholar and there's other places where they can go and find information. So they don't necessarily think they still need the help of a librarian to do that. So a lot of paper place libraries that you know have downsizing their stuff so a lot of librarians necessarily um going out the door so people don't think they need librarians but what i discovered being someone working with researchers more directly was they still need us to help them find information but the information they want our help to find is in data they've already got maybe they've collected a data set and they need help with analyzing it or getting the you know, the findings out of it, or they want to combine data from different sources, or they want to acquire data from somewhere else, or they want to create it, but then they need help with how they're going to work with the data. So it might be messy, and they've got to clean it up, or they want to find some way of visualizing it so that they can see better what they've got. So I think 
we have a role to play in helping them acquire those skills. So when I came here, I said to people, I want us to be able to support researchers working with data. We need to skill you up so that you can do that. So we started teaching them uh, how to use tools like Open Refine. We started developing these self-paced workshops around text mining and web scraping, helping people acquire data from other places, external data sets, using APIs. So we had to do quite a lot of skilling up, but the idea was the librarians could be skilled up to do this role to support researchers in this way because no one else was teaching them how to do this stuff and we found there was a bit of a gap there. So I think we have tried to see ourselves now as sort of partners in the research process. We can bring certain skills to the table. And one of the good things I think that's happened is everyone expects researchers to manage their data well now. And the library is really the place where that work sits. So people will come to the library and get our advice on how they're going to plan their data, how they're going to manage their data. So when you open that conversation up with a researcher, you can bring in all other things and identify problems that they've still got. So you can talk them right where you're going to put it and is your data sensitive and um, do you need to share it with people and have you got external providers you're using, whether you're sequencing genomes or you're getting your data transcribed from interviews, what are the protocols you need to put in place so you can have a really wide ranging conversation with them, identify where their gaps are and then help them either acquire the training they need, maybe by going to a carpentry's workshop or coming to a workshop that we're doing. But we're helping to sort of build the skill of staff as we go. And then in that conversation, we talk to them about the things like file naming conventions and project structures and all the things that make the work reproducible so that if they want to reproduce their research or make it open at the end, they can do that. So we've got a really good thing going, I think, in the way that we're trying to, to help them. From a lot of what do you say uh, overlappings with a lot of what I know that is a data stewardship is so yeah. is uh, moving from like being a librarian to be a, like a data steward or do you see those roles a little bit different? No, I don't really see us as as data stewards. No, I I think that is quite a complex role um, and that's probably more likely to sit within the research group itself but what we try to do is raise awareness of a whole range of issues um, so that the people in the research team understand what their responsibilities are but also what all the other issues are so in Australia there is a thing called the code for the responsible conduct of research and it has it places obligations on researchers to manage their data well. So researchers often think we don't know how to do that. So the library can help us. So that's where we can get in there and have those good conversations. But we're just trying to raise the issues with them so that then they're responsible for managing the data, um, but we have at least alerted them to the issues that might trip them up. So there are no designated roles as data stewards in this organization that I know of. I think each research team manages things differently and each research institute has a different vision, but we're certainly in there providing enough information so that at least they know what they need to do. Cool, thank you. Uh, our time is running a little bit out. There is any project that you want to share with our audience? I remember in pre-COVID there's lots of uh, events going on in Australia, especially like Res Plaza, Associated We're doing ResBaz again Yay! in August this year. So we we ran a really good ResBaz last year in November um, at the University of Queensland. So that was a collaboration between uh, four different universities and we had a really good roll up. We had some fantastic um, speakers, had uh, the Australian uh, Queensland chief scientist here doing some fantastic talks. So we're going to do ResPaz at Griffith University, but again, open to all the universities in the state who want to come along and we'll be teaching a whole range of these things. So lots of carpentries, but also bioinformatics, um, spatial, you know, all of those things. So definitely um, going big with that. And one of the people from our ResPaz Brisbane is moving to France. So we're oh. thinking about trying to get ResPaz in France. France. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh Thank you, Belinda, for your time. This was a very joyful and delightful conversation. I hope that okay, you have a well, good thank afternoon. You. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, same to you. Thanks, Ranieri. Good luck with the channel.